Sure. Okay. All right. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody. We are back once again with another fantastic lecture by uh, Mr. Winter. Uh, first and foremost, sir, how are you? And the floor is yours. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Yes. So this is with Generation Z. And I really enjoyed our last lectures. Uh, this is the fourth in the series, uh, Generation Z, with Dave here and also Rio, his partner. It was wonderful last time. We had a lot of fun. <laughs> and uh, as everyone knows, I'm Dan Winter, fractalfield.com. Uh, this evening's lecture, title, uh, Living Plasma, Measuring Life Force, subtitled Reif, Naissance, and Bechon, The History of Negentropy, Somatids, and Microzymes. The history of neg entropy in, in healing frequencies. So we're going to be talking about healing frequencies tonight. And um, let's see, I hit pin here. So um, we're going to try to cover some things fairly esoteric this evening. Remember that our theme through many of these lectures has been, how is it that living clouds of plasma charge become intelligent and have life force? and in a sense have a mind of their own. In fact, we are saying that the plasma, toroidal plasma domain that inhabits your, your mind, your brain, is actually the primary organ of perception. So it's the intelligence of that toroidal plasma field, which is the essence of consciousness itself. So learning more about how a living cloud of plasma charge becomes self-aware, alive, uh, has intention as it were, Learning the physics of that is highly instructive to the nature of spirituality and life force in general. And then uh, on this coming Friday, my lecture is with Elena Denon again, who was worth it, working on the galactic history of many of you know, and we will be talking about adva advanced plasma intelligence, the story of Enki and the nine and uh, how the nine plasma cloud toroidal domains become self-organizing. And that is an ancient spiritual history story and relates to the latest in the galactic history story. So that's coming up on Friday. But for today, we want to really focus on some pretty serious science. And so our way of talking about how we uh, document how living plasma becomes alive and intelligence, uh, we're going to use uh, uh, powerful microscopy stories, the story of the famous Raymond Reif microscope, the Gaston Naissance, Gal Galileo, the microsome story, and a bit about Antoine Béchamp, the story of somatids and microzymes, and kind of the physics of that microscopy as a way of understanding more about the history of the measurement of living plasma, the measurement of life force, and creating healing frequencies in neg entropy using the understanding you got from seeing the life force alive as rife and you just muted yourself oh there's somebody yeah sorry sorry uh, of using the the actual microscopic uh, vision and uh, measurement of life force to understand what frequencies create healing and what frequencies collapse uh, viruses and bacteria so that's the history story, that's the context. Now, another part of tonight's conversation is my partner, Valerie, who's very active with the Ananda Marga spiritual community around the world, and they're wonderful. They have missionaries around the world and they're extremely dedicated. And their spiritual tradition has a concept of life force, which they call, um, uh, <laughs> which they call microvita. And uh, it's a very in-depth, uh, ancient Indian wisdom about the nature of life force they call microvita. And uh, that I appreciate that conversation because they begin to think about positive and negative life force they call positive and negative microvita. The challenge, of course, is to turn that conversation, which is a beautiful spiritual philosophy, into physics. And the key challenge there, of course, is measuring life force which is of course the subtitle of today's conversation, measuring life force. So to set the context for this story of measuring life force, I'm gonna start with the images at the uh, web article called measuring life force. Here we go, Google Chrome, share, share image. So I'm going to measuring life force and hopefully you're seeing my screen now. This is goldenmean.info slash measuring life force. And, um, we're saying that 
we actually have documented three ways to measure life force in our uh, lifetime of work on the physics of life force. And the article about that is goldenmean.info slash architecture, where we show as here that you can take a frequency signature of the weak capacitive electric field, in this case of a tree, but also you can do it for a building and look for the harmonics in the weak electric field as we did here in the measurement of this very happy tree in South France. And notice the frequencies we measured in this tree are quite literally the Schumann, the famous Schumann harmonics right here, 7.8 Hertz and uh, four, around 14 Hertz and then 20, around 20 Hertz. So the classic well-known physics of Schumann harmonics were measured in this tree by using our technology for measuring life force which is the second link on top here, flameinmind.com slash life force. And what we do, we take a, a brainwave spectrum analyzer, which is doing a harmonic analysis of about one microvolt, like a brainwave, and we measure a tree or a building. And we've actually proven with this technology in our international curriculum on biologic architecture that you can predict in advance what building will cause a seed to germinate and children to grow <laughs> by measuring whether the capacitance, the harmonics, the frequency signature is imploding. So actually specifically the three ways we've shown measurement of life force in those web links, goldenmean.info slash architecture are this one, flameinmind.com slash life force, where we simply measure the weak electric field for harmonic cascade. For example, you can tell in advance which tree is going to die when it's got a sick harmonic in there. And, uh, the second way we've measured life force is by measuring seed germination, that you actually measure seed germination in the aluminum poison building versus a bamboo gorgeous building. And you can see the capacitance of that aluminum steel building is killing the seeds. You can measure it. You can describe exactly why failure to distribute charge is literally anti-life force, what the Ananda Marga people would call negative microvita. So that's examples of measuring life force. And then further, we showed that life force is quantized by Planck. Planck is the universal musical key signature of the universe, Planck length, time, and energy. And you multiply by powers of golden ratio called phase conjugation, fractality embedding perfected. And you get the frequencies that create charge collapse, therefore life force, therefore neg entropy. As many of you have seen, we've talked about that many times. You get the three radiative hydrogen, you get the two frequencies of photosynthesis, and you get the Schumann harmonics and the Bliss brainwave harmonics. And here are the Bliss brainwave harmonics, which are the Schumann harmonics, which are the calculated harmonics of Planck times golden ratio, perfectly fractalfield.com. Here's another example of measuring a bamboo building for harmonics as we did a pyramid, and we measure the harmonic cascade. And here's again the Schumann harmonics compared to the brainwave harmonics in green. And, and uh, I'm sorry, the Schumann harmonics are here in green and the calculated harmonics from Planck and Golden Ratio are in blue. You see the correlation. So that is implosive charge collapse and that is measuring life force. Now, where we're going with that in this evening's conversation here is we're looking at the history of the clairvoyant uh, perception of life force the clairvoyant perception of the Anu, uh, occult chemistry by Ledbetter and Bissant, famous in the theosophic tradition, which later became psi perception of quarks, where the occult chemistry was proven in today's subatomic physics, three Anu, and these are an Anu per unit quark. The reason, and well, the reason there's seven spins outside, five spins inside in the classic clairvoyant perception of the perfected slipknot of the toroid of life force, is because seven spins outside is the seven spin symmetries of tetra cube, and the five spins inside is the five spin symmetry of dodecahedron, obviously. And that's the five seven spin pair arrangement of, for example, the seven layers of heart muscle from the Pettigrew dissection fields of form vortex of life, anthroposophic biodynamics, and the five spins inside. So five spins inside, seven spins outside is more than metaphor for the perfect slipknot, the perfect torus, the perfect implosion, and life force. The point to be made here is my friends, Murray Zupa, famously in Polish in Buffalo, New York, painted for years these little tiny slipknot anu of life force and showed that those little tiny toroidal domains of life force 
when they were inside living material, they were impish and happy and alive and, and uh, mischievous almost. Whereas if you looked at those same Anu structures inside, for example, a block of aluminum, no, they were dead. And this work was then carried on famously by another friend of mine, uh, Dora Kunz, the president of the International Theosophical Association I met with in, East, in Wheaton, Illinois, co-founder of, co of Touch for Health, and her husband, Fritz Kunz, wrote the famous book on occult uses of gemstones. So Dora Kunz and many others showed that clairvoyants who saw life force saw that these little slipknots became alive with happy plasma when they were in living structures and became unhappy when they were in dead structures because the difference is failure to distribute charge. So that's going to lead us now to a conversation about um, how life force was measured by Raymond Royal Rife, the famous Rife scope and the Rife frequencies. And we're going to actually try to talk about a bit of that physics, how that worked, which is a very esoteric subject. <laughs> and uh, on uh, uh, Gaston Naissance, Galileo the Microscope, uh, the book about that was written by a close friend, Chris Bird, who at that time was working with me on some of the French translation. And by the way, I was a lousy French translator, as I am still today. <laughs> but uh, Chris Bird, writing his book, Galileo the Microscope, about Gaston Naissance and the discovery of what he called the somatid and the somatid cycles. And here's the picture here. There's the somatid cycle. So they were looking at using this microscope that was able to see at, at the resolution of at that time what was only available to electron microscopes. Remember, electron microscopes had the resolution, but could only look at dead stuff. <laughs> Reason? <laughs> because the preparation of the slide for an electron microscope for electron smashing to, to see uh, required that it be dead. You couldn't look at it alive. So you couldn't see the living plasma. Whereas Raymond Royal Rife, Gaston Naissance, and indirectly uh, Béchamp, famous in France, were able to look at the living plasma alive. And, and so they, they then saw the sequence of the, the pleomorphism, as it was called, of the stages of the growth of the somatid cycles, which later Gaston, famously Béchamp here in France, called uh, microzyme. And the, the metamorphosis or pleomorphism in the stages of the somatid cycle, how living plasma went through that cycle was their discovery. And then later we'll see that's how Béchamp and others realized that inside the living cell, the metabolism takes a wrong turn in the presence of stress or too much sugar and how cancer happens because of a wrong turn in this cycle of the somatid, the, the pleomorphic uh, morphing shape of living plasma, all of which was enabled because Raymond Royal Rife was able to see. Now, how they saw, we'll just look at a few more pictures here. This is the Raymond one. So this is Raymond Royal Rife, uh, and, and he uh, built this microscope. And we're gonna talk about the physics of how that worked in a, in a moment here, in a way to try to understand the, um, by understanding how they were able to see living viruses, uh, we can then understand the history of looking at uh, life force. Remember, Raymond Royal Rife, now I'm gonna put all these uh, links of these articles about Rife and the pictures, will all be at goldenmean.info slash measuring life force, which is the key article for this evening conversation. I'll put all the links there. But for example, in this article originally from the French is explaining that Rife actually was honored by almost a whole, uh, like dozens of the leading medical doctors of his day all honored him for in fact having uh, massively cured cancer. And he was, uh, honored by the uh, leading medical institutions of the day. Sadly, you know what really ended Rife's career was when the, the director of the American Medical Association decided he wanted to control Rife's technology. And Rife says, no, you're not, I'm not selling it to you, Morris Fishbein. Then it was all downhill from there in the court case and the, the discouraged Rife ended up, sadly, it's a disaster story. Another American Medical Association disaster stories, but let's not go there this evening. What we wanna talk about is the physics, okay? So 
Now I'm going to pause this screen share for just a second. Um, stop the show. And you're going to see just my face for a moment. <laughs> this is my little chance to tell you my story. Now, um, this story also indirectly is how I came to be aware of Antoine Priory, who famously in France used some of Rife, Lakovsky, and Tesla's frequencies, which they discovered by the process we just discussed, to heal thousands of cancers documented by the French government here in France, Antoine Priory. And that physics is what became Therify.net, now actively doing plasma reju rejuvenation mega entropy in 25 countries. The turning point was the day that we found the frequencies that Antoine Priori got from Tesla, Reif, Lakowski. The best frequencies that Antoine Priori got fit my equation, Planck times integer exponents golden ratio. That was the day we discovered the physics of phase conjugate negentropy was what was behind what Antoine Priori was doing. Even though Priori himself did not know what phase conjugation was, did not know how to perfect those frequencies, and didn't even know that you needed an opposing pair of those uh, noble gas plasma tubes in order to phase conjugate, make two pine cones kiss noses accurately, which everyone now knows is the physics behind phase conjugation perfect. So my story of how I got into that, this is a little bit of the, this, this is supposed to add a local color here. Um, I was in Buffalo, New York, and I was, I was nicely, kindly adopted by a professor of medical microscopy in the medical school at the University of Buffalo named John Hubbard. And John Hubbard had spent half of his life studying Raymond Royal Weiss, actually. And uh, uh, he frequently went to visit John Crane, who's famously described in all the histories of Rife's life, the a guy in Southern Cal, who eventually was uh, had into great legal trouble, who ended up with the remaining Rife scopes, as famously described in all the histories of Raymond Royal Rife. So John Hubbard, my professor, MD, professor of microscopy, University of Buffalo Medical School, was buddies or went to see John Crane very often. And frankly, dealing with John Crane was very messy, it was complicated. And then collectively, we used to visit one of the leading, in my view, optical science microscopy, um, uh, John uh, uh, Gibbon at um, University of Rochester, famous for optics, the science of optics. And so uh, Professor Gibbon and uh, John Hubbard, uh, after five to 10 years working with them, uh, we came up with a model for the, the optical physics of how the Rife scope worked. And that's a conversation that's instructive. And I'm gonna provide now, right now, I'm gonna provide two separate, initially different, but actually related theories of how the Rife scope worked. Now, in order to, um, which was, this is still, no one on this planet actually probably understands all of these are only theories because there's no really functioning Rife scope today, actually, sadly. However, the conversation is very instructive. And the essential problem, and, and it's very helpful for you to visualize this, is that the classic problem in physics for optical microscopy is you cannot see anything smaller than the wavelength with, with which you are looking at something. <laughs> so if the wavelength of the light you're using, for example, infrared, is like a thousand times bigger then the virus you want to look at, you ain't going to see it. That is the problem. So all of these microscopists had to figure out a way of disobeying the law. The law being that you can't see anything smaller than the wavelength with which you are looking. Now, there is a, a series, I, I'm going to show you some pictures in a minute, uh, where uh, microscopy has today optical microscopy has learned ways to get around that law. And the way they do it is they create literally a shadow. It's called Namarsky interference and phase contrast microscopy. And basically what you're doing is you're creating a shadow so you can use a, a difference of the wave. In, in fact, in Namarsky interference and phase contrast microscopy, they use what's called the plane of polarity of polarity in polarized light. 
So basically, if, if the polarized light is all in this plane coming up through your lenses, your microscope, and, and then you take another uh, image of also polarized light, like, but at this angle, as it goes up the axis of your microscope through the lenses, and then you rotate the interference image, the reference beam, which went through the virus, into phase with the interference beam. You have a reference beam, which the reference beam actually is the beam that's pure and has not interfered. And the interference beam is the one that went through the virus. And if you rotate those two beams back into phase, the planes of polarity, you can create a shadow. And that shadow will reveal what's in the difference of the phase contrast, literally phase contrast microphone. You can see the shadow of something smaller than the wavelength you looked at. And that is, now this is advanced physics and there's a lot of optical microscopists that spend like eight years in graduate school before they really understand how that works. However, we want to get at the genius of Raymond Royal Rife. Now the genius of Raymond Royal Rife was that he realized that um, the ultraviolet light was also the light which could stimulate viruses to blow up. <laughs> you know, how, how to, uh, so he used ultraviolet heterodynes. And, um, and interestingly, uh, glass will not pass ultraviolet. Now, Reif was a lifetime expert in grinding lenses which were made of quartz. And interestingly, quartz will conduct ultraviolet light. Glass will generally not. And um, uh, um, so th there's another fascinating and wonderful property of quartz that uh, Raymond Royal Reif, the genius used, which is called birefringence, which is that when uh, light goes up the Z or long helical axis of quartz, it is split into two different planes of polarity. And for this, I guess I really have to, <laughs> back to the pictures. Pictures are gonna help us here, so just bear with me a moment. Back to the pictures, share screen. So we're gonna show the picture now of birefringence and quartz. So first, um, you see, we're trying to see how was the genius of Rife grinding quartz lenses better than anyone else on the planet, enabling him to see magically down to the, wavelength of a virus, which is smaller than, than most light wavelengths, and then enabling him to see life force. So uh, he used this, th this is a quartz crystal here, you see, and the Z axis of this quartz is a hexagon because the SiO2 silicon dioxide bond geometry here is tetracubic. And if you ratchet a tetracube from a Z axis up a helix, the shadow of that is going to be hexagonal like this quartz crystal here. Now, this is the model of birefringence. So what happens is that as polarized light enters the quartz crystal, it's split into two different planes of polarity. The name for that is called birefringence, picture right here. Uh, so the, the beam enters the quartz crystal and it's split into two planes of polarized light. And uh, uh, Reif's genius was to, he had one beam of light, polarized light that went through the virus and one beam that didn't. And he used the birefringence of the quartz itself to rotate the reference beam and the interference beam back into the same plane and create that shadow, which was better than Namarsky or the other conventional interference microscopy, which is only done with glass lenses, not quartz lenses, because you could do this with ultraviolet. And you could then have the bioactive ultraviolet. And um, this enabled Rife to see, now I'm gonna stop the screen share again. This enabled Rife to begin to see these shadows of the actual life force in uh, the pleomorphing somatid cycles. And then Gaston Naissance later used um, parallel methods of creating this interference microscopy. But Gaston Naissance uh, did not use ultraviolet and quartz. There were other methods of doing this. Actually, I think we have to share, share that picture too. One moment, Google Chrome by infringence. There we go. So Gaston Naissance, let's see here, another look. Uh, here, this is Gaston Naissance. So, um, yeah, uh, Gaston Naissance 
But remember, so here is my friend Chris Berg writing a book about Gaston Nessance, who followed Raymond Rice's work, and he developed this 714X, which is a, um, he, he, by seeing which frequency is zapping the, the virus, and by seeing um, which um, uh, solution to fermentation, he called it GN24, was actually uh, zapping the bugs, um, being able to see it alive was life or death. So th there's several pictures here of um, this difference between on the left, a healthy cell where the metabolism goes to the mitochondria uh, with the byproduct gly glycolysis, whereas on the right, a cancer cell, excess glucose and excess stress. And that was the genius of Béchamp. He proved by measurement that stress caused the cell to take the wrong turn in fermentation uh, to produce lactic acid and other poisonous byproducts, which uh, infects, infest the nucleus and cause cancer and actually measured that process. Here is one of the screens I wanted to share with you. So um, Gaston Naisson's microscope took this incandescent light and ultraviolet light and mixed it into a heterodyne called a luminescent ray here, and then used a Zeeman effect magnetic field uh, to zap the beam and then mix that beam. And that mixture is what allowed him to uh, uh, create this heterodyne cascade. And uh, now we, we don't want to get too esoteric here, but there's, if, you know, if, if we want to at least pretend we've studied the physics, we have to look briefly at Tom Bearden. Because Tom Bearden is saying the heterodyning effect here is much deeper than the optics uh, uh, professors that I work with. And so I need um, uh, Tom Bearden's uh, paper on this. Is, and I, remember, I'm going to have all the links to this uh, is called right here. It's called a novel principle behind Wilhelm Reich. Here we go. You see, novel principles in the Rife microscope uh, and Rife's greatest se secret by Tom Bearden. Now, I am sharing something with you here, which is highly esoteric, and I would say most optical PhDs on the planet wouldn't understand this at all, actually. Uh, but uh, what Tom Bearden is saying is that the subatomic principles inside the microzyme, the somatid, uh, are what he would call a phase conjugate time reverse wave, what I would call charge implosion, and the essence of life force. And because life force, in essence, is phase conjugate, therefore, you can take the frequency ratio of the subatomic and suboptical wavelength scale of the, that mechanism, and you can cascade the heterodyne recursively up through optical heterodynes in a, in a kind of a ladder. And so what, what he's saying is that, and I don't think, I don't know if we have all the pictures here, but Tom Bearden is saying that what Rife did, and I'm gonna show you some of the pictures on the bottom. Now, this is not a bad one. So he called it iterative magnifying stages, Rife's great secret. So here's, he called it virtual state and quantum threshold. He's saying that the interferometry, remember all of physics is interferometry. The wave interference is not just the stuff of a somatid cycle, but you know, a, block, a, a block of steel is also just wave interference, except it's macro, but it's all wave interference. But because life force wave interference is phase conjugate, which means recursive, which means implosive, which means fractal, you can cascade that interferometry up through iterative magnifying stages. And what those iterative magnifying stages were is, for example, in the case of Rife, it was infrared and ultraviolet, and that frequency difference was very fixed. And that's creating a heterodyne cascade. And you pass through that heterodyne cascade, the information of the wave heterodyne of the subatomic geometry of the somatid uh, microzyme, and that because the recursive adding and multiplying heterodyning interferometry inside that fixed frequency gap, not unlike the carbon arc of Tesla, uh, it'll carry that information up to longer wavelengths coherently. And you do that recursively. That is basically iterative 
optical heterodyning carrying a short wavelength in a perfect cascade of contiguous ratios up to a longer wavelength. That is, that's a bit of an esoteric concept. Now he's saying also that this is what Antoine Priori did when he would pump this longitudinal wave recursively into the cell and time reverse. Uh, remember, uh, Tom Bearden spent his lifetime on Priory, Antoine Priory, as actually did uh, Chris Bird before him. Chris Bird actually sent me uh, Priory's books in French before I even knew enough French to, <laughs> that's many years ago. And he was focused on Priory. So here it is, you see, the, there's, it's called a transverse pump wave and an amp amplified phase conjugate wave, which means basically a longitudinal wave. And you, you pump these waves into a cent the center and it, when it becomes, the longitudinal wave pumping goes to a critical threshold. The compression effect creates a situation within which only phase coherence survives. In other words, you get symmetric compression from all sides, and that compression creates an implosion of the plasma to a phase conjugate point, visualize the center of a torus or an anu. And all of the recursion of the waveform and that plasma, because it got focused so well on its center point that the only surviving emerging waves were those that were in phase. And that is called negentropy because it was self sorting because of phase conjugate negentropic charge implosion. That's what negentropy is. The self sorting that results from perfected implosion, perfected fractality. And if you visualize those two pine cones creating that compression, you can understand how the neg entropy occurs. Now, admittedly, Tom Bearden's paper would be beyond, be beyond most electrical engineers in my generation. And uh, I would just point out to you that, um, that uh, the concept of phase conjugation as Tom Bearden implemented it uh, became the story of the Russian woodpecker and led from Chris Bird's study of Priory, Tom Bearden's study of Priory, to my discovery of that equation, Planck times integer exponential golden ratio, which suddenly gave a very specific frequency physics. Now, um, obviously some of that is a little bit esoteric and I, I'm gonna finish this in just a few minutes and then we're gonna open this up to questions. But where, where I want to go to finish this is, um, <laughs> the reason I want to try to finish this before we go to questions is because see, I'm going to see if I can keep this whole story in my head for another few minutes. But, but the, the climactic part of this story is the wave mechanics of life itself. And to try to see, see that in essence, I want to go back to uh, the physics of cancer. So I'm going to this website uh, it's called goldenmean.info slash cancer. And uh, there's laws of form. We don't have to find this. Um, so form, novel, title. Yes, here we are. Is embedding a mathematical opposite to cancer as wave fractionation. So what is cancer in essence as wave mechanics? Can that be summarized in very simple terms? And here's a way to think about that, which I think is very constructive. This is from an article I wrote a long time ago, goldenmean.info slash cancer. So here, here is the story. My friend at that time, uh, Earl Etienne, professor of biophysics, University of Rochester, um, he taught me that the way in which you can measure whether the cell is healthy or cancerous was you look at the wavelengths of metabolism inside the living cell. And what he knew that very few people knew except Rife was that high quality ultraviolet light was the motor of all cellular biophysics. This is a statement from a very advanced. So, so high quality UV light is driving cellular biophysics. It's literally the sex juice of the living cell, high quality UV. And what happens is you have incoming proteins long way food and they become DNA pre precursors and they become high quality ultraviolet light. And the wavelengths fit this caduceus shaped cascade. And if that cascade of frequencies is imploding accurately into what is not just perfected harmonic inclusiveness, which ultimately is pure perfected charge collapse, which is pure phase conjugation, fits my equation. So suddenly you know what frequencies inside cell metabolism make a healthy cell 
where charge collapse is enabled, all by understanding this high quality UV light. So now that may sound a little bit too complicated to you, and that relates also to the, 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 um, the idea that the biologic terrain predicts whether you have cancer. You measure in the cell a redox, acidity, and resistance. And if your cell ha has uh, the wrong redox, poor redox, and it has high acidity, you have cancer by definition. So all you have to do is measure three variables in the electric liquid of the cell, resistance, acidity, and redox, redox production oxidase potential. And suddenly you know whether that cell is cancerous or healthy. This is called biologic terrain analysis. So if the terrain, if the environment of the cell is healthy, then da da da. So what that acidity means, and here is a negative ion wind healing cancer, a prerequisite. And remember, therify.net is just a very strong negative ion wind. That's what makes sense. Anyway, here is the article. So what we said, the best way to think about the healthy cancer cell then, in terms of harmonic inclusiveness equals vitality, the definition of immune health and heart rate variability, classic medical physics, fastest way to measure whether you have an immune system or not is check for harmonic inclusiveness not just in heart rate variability, fractality, but in everything, any living thing in the universe, a tree, a cell, a heartbeat, check for harmonic inclusiveness, you got life. If it's harmonic exclusive, you got death. And that's not complicated, is it? And an example of harmonic inclusiveness is in the cell, if the cell is egg-shaped, then the interferometry of that um, the, what's holding that cell together as a soap bubble is more harmonic inclusiveness than if that cell is a sphere. If the cell is a spherical shape, by definition, mathematically, it means harmonically exclusive. It took only one frequency to make a sphere. That's that. So in biophysics, you can measure when the cell became cancerous by checking to see if it's a sphere. This is old news. So if the cell is a sphere, it is statistically most likely that it's cancer. The reason? <laughs> The cell membrane is a soap bubble that is harmonic exclusive. Now, this goes back to a very ancient concept called the laws of form by Spencer Brown, which basically is that similar to the ancient paper um, laws of form and uh, the not geometric extension of consciousness, structural stability and morphogenesis by Rene Thome. And what both of them are saying is that all living cell membranes are soap bubbles woven together of frequencies. Well, that's uh, pretty obvious. But the frequencies that weave together the soap bubble called the living cell membrane can be summarized in laws of form by, you take a, a bracket, a waveform, are you inside or are you outside? If you're outside, you're outside the bracket, if you're inside. And you can do that nesting embed ability study it was called laws of form. And that nesting represented by the laws of form eventually invents all of calculus. That was the statement of G. Spencer Brown. But more importantly, it tells you that by taking the soap bubble, the foldedness of membrane, fold inside, fold outside, then it's folded inside. That's called embedding and perfect nesting and entanglement perfected, which is a, a classic concept which comes to a climax in the physics of phase conjugation, which is perfect nesting, perfect embeddability by definition. So this, this, the physics of laws of form is saying, is saying that uh, if the little wave fits inside the big wave, perfectly called embeddable or phase conjugate or perfect nesting, then you can exist inside the mind of God. I mean, the little wave can survive non-destructively interferometrically with respect to the bigger wave. Now, the nature of life force was that the cascade of harmonics that was keeping the microzyme alive is precisely those that are conjugate fractal. That's why they could cascade up the fractal ladder in the perfected heterodyne. Remember, phase conjugation is recursive heterodyning perfected by definition, golden ratio, perfected constructive wave interference. Therefore, to get the little to heterodyne up so you can see it as big, living plasma is perfect and dead plasma is terrible. <laughs> so that ability of, of nesting is the very essence of life. And carrying that geometry is what Tom Bearden is talking about as a physics of, of, of life. Now, here's the, the final thought, is actually, if you understand what Tom Bearden is saying, is that 
perfected optical header dining is what got the small wave into uh, visible into big wave <laughs> is analogous to what my optics professors were saying, which was the shadow of the two planes of polarized light, we're also creating perfected heterodyne. Remember, Raymond Royal Rife used to spend days, days just to get one slide in focus in his microscope. It was, it was, a, it was exceedingly difficult. And, and they say that's proof of what his genius was, was then he was getting that living plasma to heterodyne in that cascade it was perfected interferometry taking place inside of the quartz crystals, which were birefringent. Well, what have we said? Remember, now here, here's, a, 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 I apologize, a, one final thought. How is this story a, a history of what became Therify.net? And that's just uh, what I wanted to uh, finish with. And uh, uh, yeah, so here is Therify.net. The result of these lifetimes of work, Chris Bird, Raymond Royal Rife, Tom Bearden. So Tesla famously had hundreds of people healed in his high voltage arcs. That's old news. And then Lakowski and Rife and Priory, they took the best frequency recipes they got from Tesla. And here, here they are. This is the frequencies Priory used, 3, 10, 32, and 80 hertz. This is in the literature. And here's my equation. 2.78, 11, 30, 1, and 80. So the, her, the frequencies Priori used by uh, trial and error only, the trials and errors of Tesla, Lakowski, Priori, and Rife became the frequency recipe of Priori. And when I saw those frequencies fit my equation is the day we learned the physics behind what Priori and Rife were trying to do, which was to phase conjugate to make perfected charge collapse negentropic. And I give a final little example here. There's hundreds of these frequency tables around the world of the frequencies Raymond Royal Rife uses. This is just one of them. <laughs> As you go down this list, look at the number of times 10,000 Hertz appears in this list of frequencies to use. And so if you just do the ABC part of this whole list of hundreds of frequencies, the frequency 10,000 Hertz appears 12 times in the first couple listings. And what is the frequency of 10,000 Hertz? Here's my equation. 9944 Hertz is perfected Golan ratio times Planck. And that frequency, 10,000 Hertz, is also the most important frequency that Stan Meyer used to do hydrolysis to make his famous hydrogen car work. 10,000 Hertz was phase conjugate implosive. And these are the frequencies of, of Schumann harmonics and brainwave harmonics right here in the equation. And this is the famous Mayer wave. So this is perfected charge collapse, perfected negentropy, and what lifetimes of work from Reif and Mikoski and Priory resulted in was discovery of pure principle of what is negentropy. So our understanding of life force is actually our understanding of how electrical charge can collapse into an array called longitudinal interferometry. And when inhabiting that array, your awareness can propagate into a larger and larger field effect. And that's what's going to be a story next time we can talk about these plasma domains of the nine, et cetera, and what was called heaven and planes of Sharon. So we have just told a short story of ways to measure life force. What we're saying in the bigger picture is evolution of consciousness, literally ascension in the next dimension, is when these harmonics phase conjugate implode and you occupy a larger and larger, broader spectral phase conjugate array, and therefore ascend. <laughs> so that was a little a piece of the history of the measurement of life force, Rife, Nesons, and Lakowski. And um, I thank you for your attention. I'm ready for questions. Wow. Well, thank you so very much, sir. That, that was incredible. Um, I, does anybody want to jump in for questions uh, before? I have a couple myself, but um, does anybody want to jump in? You can raise your hand virtually if you know how to, or yes, Riel. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dan. That was phenomenal. That, uh, wow. I took a page and a half of notes, just trying to write down as quickly as I can, and then I'm going to try to process it, and go over your uh, slides and all the notes that you're going to be sharing with us. But yeah, wow. Um, let's see, I posted some things in the chat just to keep myself uh, 
Yeah, okay. So early on, actually, one of your slides mentioned, so this is a kind of a three-parter, um, but the first one was you mentioned to ignore Greg Braden on the slide. And that's an interesting one because he's, I know he's a big face in all of this with his geology and science, uh, uh, scientist background. So I'm just curious about uh, how he's involved with this, as well as bringing up the Anu slash Quark and like, why is it called an Anu? Is that your own term or that's the scientific term for Anu? And I mean, Anunnaki and all the <laughs> Anubis, like what a root word that is. And then as well as, this is gonna be a little more controversial, so I'll try not to be too outspoken, but the electron microscopes are what is being used to provide evidence that a certain virus going around the world has been purified and isolated. And there's a, there are two scientists that I've been listening to that say that using the electron microscope doesn't actually prove that there is the uh, virus that's been purified and isolated. So I don't know if, if you know are familiar with that. I don't know if I can talk about their names because this is going to be going on YouTube, but just that's something that I thought of immediately. So yeah, those those three points. Uh, Real was with us last time. He is a very sharp dude there, Real. <laughs> Real also has shamanic ancestors. He's a he's a cool guy. <laughs> Thanks for asking the funnest questions. Well, well uh, the first question is really quite simple. Uh, Greg Braden, uh, whom I like a lot. He's really a wonderful, sweet guy and has used electrical engineering to talk about science consciousness. Uh, and we used to hang out. In fact, we got stuck together in a river. <laughs> it's a long story. But anyway, no, there was, but there is one crit slight criticism, which with Greg Braden has suggested to people that they watch for the Schumann harmonic frequencies to simply increase in frequency. And sadly, that is a bit of a childish oversimplification. It is not that the Schumann harmonics base frequency, you know, they say 8, 11, 17. The base frequency of the Schumann harmonic is fixed by the natural resonance frequency, the standing wave of the resonance waveform between the earth and the ionosphere. And that bouncing standing wave, if you divide by the speed of light, you get roughly eight hertz. And that is a resonant cavity and that doesn't change and it's not supposed to. But what does change, and so the, I showed accurately the well-known physics graph of the normal contained harmonics of the Schumann harmonic cascade. And that is relatively fixed. So to so say the Schumann harmonic is increasing, that's simplistic and childish, it's not helpful. No, the actual physics though, which is instructive, is that if you look at the Schumann harmonic cascade, it will evolve in harmonic inclusiveness. So ex exactly like in your brain waves, when the alpha, theta, and delta all fall into golden ratio, which happen to be exactly the Schumann harmonics, not a coincidence. <laughs> so that, that evolving harmonic inclusiveness in the Schumann harmonic cascade indicates the evolution of the implosive neg entropy that's called named Gaia, because Earth is demonstrably, by Lovelock, negentropic. So we should look for increasing harmonic inclusiveness very instructive in the Schumann harmonic cascade. But to say the Schumann harmonic just increased, that's a bit superficial. That was just a little bit of uh, evolution on some things that Greg Braden has been talking about. But it's, I still love Greg Braden. He's a great guy. So uh, your second question what had to do with Anu. Yes. Um, the term Anu uh, historically meant sun god. Even if, and we know that every religion on planet Earth is a sun god religion. Any historian can tell you that Christianity is just one example of hundreds of, of sun god. So everybody knows that the sun is the god, whether it's Atun, because it's the most intelligent plasma being in our neighborhood. It's a good name. It's appropriate. Anu. And when the occult chemistry clairvoyance had just finished creating the subatomic chart before the subatomics was understood. This is the book Psi Perception of Quarks by Phillips, my friend, who proved that the subatomic clairvoyance of Levy and Brisson predicted in advance the subatomic hadrons of nuclear physics today. They, the, the clairvoyance knew subatomic physics before today's physicists. It's really a good story. But they also looked at the heart of the sun and they saw the Anu. <laughs> well, what's at the heart of the plasma at the center of the sun? Oh, that same seven spins, five spins, perfect slipknot, which you also see if you look at the human heart, then if you look at the heart of hydrogen, they saw the same thing. <laughs> and why was it called Anu? Well, it was the archetype of perfected slipknot, seven spins outside, five spins inside, tetra cube, 
Nodeki Kosa, Star Mother Kit, Perfect Implosion, Perfect Wave Collapse. Perfect Wave Collapse is the intelligence of the heart of the sun, the heart of the human, and the heart of hydrogen. It's all, and the, the subatomic physics has been informed correctly in subatomic physics by those clairvoyant investigations. This is non trivial. So, uh, and, you know, well, well, with the Anunnaki, where they, they called sun, well, they were wannabes. They wanted to be sun gods. And if you don't grow up with plasma field big enough to, its, to inhabit the sun, well, sorry, you didn't graduate from kindergarten. So, anyway. That so this, makes sense. With sorry, with I just wanted to say with the Anunnaki wanting to be sun gods, that I mean that would uh, yeah. that certainly makes more sense to me. Even Yahweh, when he called it, even Enlil, who was he was a failed clone and became the god, yeah, Yahweh. Uh, when he called himself Yahweh, Yahweh is the name of the two plasma cones, which is the shape of the Orion Nebula. And if you can inhabit those two plasma cones, you are a big plasma intelligent plasma but it didn't mean that he succeeded no he was a right. wannabe <laughs> but but i think we should go to your third question yes sorry i wanted to go uh scott and then daniel yeah oh but, well so oh, uh, Dan, you oh. wanted to address the third question i had yes. oh my apologies no no so just briefly so your third question was about um oh uh, uh the electron microscopes yeah, i remember okay well the criticism here is electron microscopy sadly can only look at dead stuff and that's that's a bit of a limitation because you ain't never going to see a living plasma field sorry <laughs> now whether that whether that is a criticism if you have isolated the virus i tend to believe carrie mullis when he said that yes that montagne never isolated the aids virus for example uh, but isolating a virus is a very complicated question and um i don't think we can I don't think that that's the only reason the virus is not isolated, but I would say that if they were using living microscopy, it would be much more powerful to look at the pleomorphism of that virus. And in fact, then we could see what electric fields inhibit that viral growth. So everything we've just talked about could be used to much more deeply understand how to inhibit that viral growth. So obviously rediscovering living, measuring life force, living microscopy instead of dead microscopy could be a great leap forward. But whether that's a specific criticism of having, have they have isolated it, that's a conversation that we can't have right now because that's, that's another half a lifetime of work. Um, thank you so sir. much, Dan. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Mm. Uh, Scott, please. Go ahead. Hello, Mr. Winters. I'm a, I'm a fan. Um, I, so I'm thinking about magnetism in the body, and you've referenced multiple times that it has a hard time, your, the plasma field has a hard time existing within uh, metal boxes and containers of the sort. Um, plasma, I, as I understand, is subject to magnetism. That's correct, right, sir? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, yes. So I was watching a video, and uh, a gentleman dropped a, a magnet between two blocks of aluminum and the effect is slowing down the fall of the, the magnet in itself. And it occurred to me that for a very long time, people have been putting things in deodorants like aluminum and all, all kinds of other things. And what, what I'm thinking about is, could that be like a multi-layered uh, situation where yes, the aluminum does prevent people from sweating. However, it also promotes Alzheimer's and maybe has even more negative effects on your, your bioelectric field? Um, well, the essential issue with aluminum steel is reflected in the pure physics of what is a dielectric constant. A dielectric constant simply means ability to distribute charge efficiently. So if you put steel and aluminum between the plates of a capacitor, you get a horrible capacitor. It doesn't store any charge. <laughs> Uh, whereas if you put barium strontium titanate or uh, yttrium niobate or, uh, or uh, shungite, <laughs> the super dielectrics between the plates of a capacitor, you get some magic. Um, the point here was that living plasma to unpack and be distributed requires efficient charge distribution, which is high dielectric constant, which means that the aura of your growing seed or your child will be in part destroyed if you put them in a steel or aluminum box. Very simple physics because the charge distribution cannot unpack distribution. I mean, it's quite simple. You put your hand on a piece of wood 
and you can feel your aura go into the wood and you can feel your aura <laughs> inspect the life. And if you close your eyes, you can actually see the picture of where the tree was and what was around the tree when it grew, if you're any good at all. You can, you can see this called psychometry. It works very simple. Whereas if you put your hand on a piece of aluminum, you can feel your hand go to sleep and get dead immediately. <laughs> It, uh, now, the reason that a magnet is obstructed when it falls down between two plates of aluminum is because the magnetic field uh, is reflected back in a right angle, and eventually the magnetic field will actually recouple, and the, the magnetic field will bounce back from the aluminum into the magnet and be held there. Uh, but that doesn't mean that aluminum is good for life force. No, it's not. Basically, the way I tried to express this was that the evolution of life was every single molecule got jealous of this esoteric club called life. And in order to get in the club, you have to get fractal or get dead. And what that means is that the geometry of the molecules rearranges themselves to get fractal, achieve charge distribution efficiency. And, and a very simple example of that is a healthy cell versus a cancer cell. There is no better definition of cancer than failure to distribute charge. Cancer at every level is charge isolation. I mean, that cell just went antisocial. And therefore, you measure whether the cell is cancer by contact inhibition. Contact inhibition means, does it respond to touch? If it responds to touch, it's not cancer by definition. If it doesn't respond to touch, that's cancer by definition. Well, responsivity to touch at the cell membrane level is charge distribution cannot feel its neighbors, quite literally. And so if, if contact doesn't inhibit definite, uh, replication, that's the name of cancer. So charge distribution efficiency is cancer's problem, failure to distribute charge. And if you create a situation that increases distribution of charge, therified net plasma, perfected just charge distribution of plasma, and cold atmosphere pl plasma, not just therified, is famous in conventional medicine for being therapeutic because it creates charge distribution. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Winters. That also makes uh, social distancing even more repugnant to me. <laughs> I agree with you completely. But select carefully those whom you hug, because once the, once there's a perfect bond, uh, you're never again separate. So you, once you touch your lover's bathwater, remember, it's always in your memory. <laughs> All right, uh, Dan, please. Sir, could you speak briefly on the concept of intention plus frequency may equal healing or, and or the opposite? Is, um, and maybe the idea of 432 versus 440 hertz. It's my understanding that like some people were out here saying that like, hey, Bob Molly's music was tuned to 432, whereas concert A is 440. And there's a different semantics uh, based on these two. Whereas I'm starting to learn that like it's more about the intention. Could you maybe just touch on that briefly? Well, you know, you know that if you put your attention, intention in your baby finger uh, and you can feel a tingling growing around your baby finger, your attention has caused a plasma vortex to develop an implosive center. And that's the be beginning of ability to steer tornadoes and whether you qualify for Gurdjieff dancing. <laughs> so intention is what brings the plasma vortex to a point and therefore steers the tornado. That's what intention is it because focused human attention is measurably electrically centripetal. So attention is absolutely key to everything because it's what eventually allows you to steer not just your plasma tornado, but stars, hopefully. <laughs> so it is all about intention, attention and intention, absolutely. Now, the extent to which that attention can implode and create centripetal force does depend on a harmonic signature. Absolutely, that's what my, our whole lives are about, that there is a frequency signature to implosion perfected. Therefore, there's a frequency signature required for attention. Golden ratio brainwave harmonics perfect attention. Uh, sunlight creates attention because it's phase conjugate photosynthesis. Whereas most of the fluorescent lights in your kid's classroom measurably prevents attention span because it's the wrong frequency recipe to create that implosion of attention. So it is about frequency, correct. Now, 432 versus 440, uh, we put together a, a, a lot, big analysis on that. Fractalfield.com slash implosion sound. And short summary, that if you take a uh, musical octaves based on 432 and 528. Remember the octave is uh, the 12th square root of two interval between every joining frequency. That's the cubic nature of the octave, which actually is not implosive. However, if you, you start your cascade 
instead of 440 hertz on 432 or 528, you do get more potential harmonics within that 12 note octave cascade that are golden ratio exponents of Planck. In other words, pure implosion sound, you get more good harmonics in 432 and 528 than you do in 440, but it's because the tuning of that cascade has enabled more implosion harmonics. And that there's a beautiful table of that in our discussion examples, fractalfield.com slash implosion sound. So in my view, these frequencies are a little bit helpful, 432 versus 5. And it is true that 440 hertz is not so ideal. I mean, you know, if you were trying to make implosion sound, 440 hertz is not the bingo. That's, I think that we could investigate it together. Thank you so much. <laughs> I have uh, two questions, sir, and then uh, I'll ask one more time if uh, anyone has any questions, then we'll, we'll call it. But um, OK, so first and foremost, I would like to ask here, um, I have and I don't mean in any way, shape or form to, to, to put you on the spot or anything like this with this question here. Um, I've been doing some uh, research as it pertains to uh, people that you may have interacted with, whether you can comment on or not. And uh, are you familiar with someone by the name of Hal Pudoff? Oh yeah, I knew how. Oh, okay, thank you. And this is my question. So if this is what my research has found in the last week, um, and uh, please don't think I'm trying to be like a private investigator here, but this is what I found. This is Hal and his friends. Th th this is you and your friends. And this is what I found. You guys have, there, there seems to be a lot of uh, intersectionality, uh, like in a Venn diagram way collaboration. Um, and Hal has recently come out. I'm not sure if you've seen that video with Eric Weinstein about, you know, he's saying remote viewing. It's, you know, it's totally real. Don't care if you believe me or not and all that. So my question is, have you worked in any um, <clears throat> capacity um, with, with Hal and his team or with anyone in that vicinity that you would be able to comment on? I'm trying and, to remember I, you, yeah. the other authors of Time, Space and Beyond put off Targ. A Russell Targ, who worked with Putoff, was a good friend because we were together at a lot of the Physics of Consciousness Symposia. He was a real character. He was traveling around like a hippie. He later became a famous teacher of physics at Russell Targ, who worked with Putoff. And they, they did work in those. And we were, we were in those uh, conversations together in the two Physics of Consciousness Symposia, one at Harvard and one in Toronto. Uh, Chris Bird was there. Marcel Vogel was there. The crew was there. Bill Tiller was there. I mean, we had the crowd. Uh, Bentoff was there. Uh, you know, we, you know, it was the party and I was the young, I was the Forrest Gump of that generation <laughs> elsewhere. So I was there and I, but I knew put off only indirectly, not directly, but I knew not a lot of those other people. And I think we were on the same track when they wrote time, space and beyond the comic book of physics of consciousness. And they were talking about action at a distance, but I don't think they got it actually at that time. Mm. It's, Today, we can teach action at a distance in great detail. We know what it is. The longitudinal interferometry, superluminal nodal connections, if the longitudinal wave reflects at the fractal node at a distance, it can resynthesize the transverse heat containing component and get action at a distance. That's the fixed physics of remote viewing, which is real, he's right. That's the physics of astral travel. That is the physics of uh, heat containment solution for fusion research on this planet, everything else is a waste of energy. It is about longitudinal interferometry, absolutely correct. And phase conjugation is the way to do it because it's how you propagate a longitudinal wave coherently. Now there's a lot too many scientists on the planets that still get that. And I haven't looked at how put us work in recent years, but I know that's the direction they were going. So they're have you, have you or any of your friends, if you can comment in any official capacity, have been approached by government entities at any point over the past 30, 40 years and were then asked to sign NDAs and things like this? I was kind of lucky in that I, um, I became global and went around the world. And so I, um, I know uh, many of my partners, uh, and I'm not going right. to mention names here, uh, developed, for example, propulsion technologies, which the government sat on. And my partners, and I'm not going to mention names, even documented what percentage of new patent applications were stolen by the military. And I'm not going to mention names, but the, the guy who invented uh, GPS, for example, it's a long story. So yes, there is a long noble tradition of the military in the USA stealing any really interesting patent. Uh, and so we have specifically avoided the patent structure for that, among many other reasons. Uh, but, I, but that, you know, the military industrial complex is always the bad guy. And that gets even a bit cliche in the end. 
the, the truth is we need to teach humans how to evolve. And yeah. uh, there are wonderful people in the military too. And uh, there are people in the military who objected when the, you know, they hid the fact that the Nazis won the war and that's all over the secret space program. Now they know there were some William Thompson, this example, these were good people in the Navy. So, um, you know, I'm not here to have that prison, but I, recently I will say that a branch friends through Valerie here have invited me to UNESCO actually that, and that, connection is, is growing here. And I presented at the, uh, the UN non-governmental agency, NGOs years ago, Harry Muller, Harry, um, and uh, so I have- uh, I Thank you. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I think you see exactly what I was trying to get at. Yeah, because I think there's, um, yes, yeah. You, you guys, your, your whole crew there, that community, I'm not trying to ask in a negative way, nor was I trying to ask for names uh, in any way, but yes, I, yeah. Um, Irene, uh, Irina, excuse me. And also, sir, if you could just let us know how much more time you have, I don't mean to. Um... I'm flexible here. I got my tea. I'm happy. Let's, uh, questions are fun. Cool. Questions are Great. fun. Uh, Irina, please. Hi, thank you, Dave. Uh, so, Dan, uh, good to hear you always. Um, are you, you going to turn your camera on? We can see your smiling face, Irina. <laughs> oh, no, I'm in no. a bad location. She's Sorry small. about that. This is okay. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead, please. I did want to talk about the harmonic inclusiveness, um, yeah. which you mentioned equals life, right? And, yeah. and sort of an egg shaped or elliptical um, yeah. structure would do that. Now, a lot of the yeah architectures formed around the belief that a sphere is of course the perfect shape. Now, how do you define if an architect was working on a sphere is, is uh, well, let's say they're working on a, an, an egg shaped uh, plan. Is the plan and the spatial the same thing creating the harmonic inclusiveness or is it just the floor plan and which means how you put things together really creates the uh, the capacitance, the charge. Capacitance, yeah. yes. Life. And so this is my question. <laughs> Everyone here should know Irena Skoda, who is I'm glad she, I'm glad you came, Irena. You're very dedicated. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Irena and I, when and others have founded bioarchitects.net. And you'll find Arena's link there and our philosophy of biologic architecture. And that's what she's referring to. And another famous architect there, Michael Rice, and you'll see him there, a wonderful biologic architect. Uh, he developed that project where he showed that egg shaped makes the most fabulous architecture on the planet. And egg shapes, if the ellipse is correct, are the perfect harmonic inclusiveness evolving the golden ratio and charge implosion. I mean, you can just have a lot of fun with the egg shape. That's actually what was behind all of the um, the, uh, the, the Fields of Form Vortex of Life book from the Anthroposophic Biodynamic, that the pine cone effectively packs and unpacks according to how much voltage it needs to get from gravity. <laughs> that's what they measured that. And, uh, and so that's a perfect egg shape really, and that's life. Versus, by contrast, when I went in to the steel and aluminum sphere, which Bucky Fuller designed and John Denver installed at the community mm -hmm. I founded, the Biodome community in Waynesville, North Carolina. It was the most geopathic structure I have ever been in in my life. <laughs> and subsequently, our friend here near Carcassonne had a spherical geodesic and he literally, literally went crazy inside that, that sphere. No, a sphere is big trouble, actually, in my mm -hmm. opinion, architecturally. And the reason is simple. It's harmonic exclusive. It's literally the, it's the membrane that does not breathe by definition. That's what a sphere is. So actually biology uses spheres for very few things. Uh, your eyeball, because there's no other way. But other than that, <laughs> you ain't gonna find many spheres around unless it's cancer. <laughs> and the reason is simple, because <laughs> it's the opposite of harmonic inclusive. And so now the way we prove that in biologic architecture is we took the the power spectrum, the way we show it, measuring life force. And you can measure the harmonics inside those buildings and predict which building causes a seed to grow. And we compared the seed germination trials with the harmonic analysis, all at goldenmean.info slash architecture. And we need to thank our, our partner in, ba in Bali, Juan Schlosser, thank you. <laughs> and uh, so, and that that project, Irena Skoda is helping us to propagate the biologic architecture curriculum around the world. Thank you, Irena. 
And so the question is um, in, in the actual shape, right? Floor well, plans. Yeah, that, that floor plans or vertical is the same right. thing. That, that whether it's a floor plan or whether it's a vertical, essentially those are harmonic components in a capacitive oscillator. So a, a circle in a floor plan isn't gonna cause a problem, but if it's a sphere on the ceiling too, it's gonna be a little bit uh, captivating for the aura. I mean, a little bit uh, overly enclosing for the aura would be the theory really true. Uh, I give one more little example and I, it may be relevant. My friend Gus Ciacacci, just before he introduced me to Bucky Fuller in Florence, he built his house in New England and the floor plan was one rung on the ladder of DNA pent hex golden ratio rectangle. That was the floor plan for the house. And in the pent, you could feel the shareable wave. You do all your public stuff. In the hex, you do all your private stuff. But in the golden ratio rectangle, which is a geometry of hydrogen, the center of every DNA ladder rung, you had that spark gap of that helix you could actually send the wave. So the, the geometry of that floor plan, using DNA for a floor plan, and you could feel the difference between the pent and the hex. Mm -hmm. OK, great. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we will go Scott, then Riel. Hello again, Mr. Winters. Uh, so you're, the uh, oval or egg shape is blowing me away. I'm making connections that I had never before even considered possible. First, first and foremost, the oval office is a whole new <laughs> kind of... Uh, Good thought. Second, uh, I have, I've been trying to understand the electromagnetic spectrum a little bit, and I know that we only see an itty-bitty slice. Infrared is in one direction towards lower by lower frequency and UV and the opposite towards higher. Uh, one's own bliss field or state, which direction would that be going or is it kind of a non sequitur? Um, eventually biology evolves up the frequency ladder but real evolution is not up or down the ladder, it's a, a bigger part of the ladder. So for example, human bliss is almost impossible unless you get the low frequencies coherent and then embedding on them are the high frequencies. And it's the presence of both that's called bliss, completes the implosion. That's what harmonic inclusiveness is. So to say that, to say that you know, uh, evolution of consciousness is a higher frequency really is not correct. If, if you can't hold the low frequency in coherence, you will never embed the high frequency. That's why you need stillness in the long wave to create coherence in the short wave. And they're both need to be present in order to, for example, if, if you recognize that you actually have nine toroidal donuts called chakras, two above, and to create the still point where you steer that tornado, you need to be very still in the long wave in order to steer the shorter wave. And the presence of both is required for evolution. I guess that would be a simple way to talk. And so that's why, you know, Rife and uh, the good guys, they used infrared and ultraviolet and did the interferometry with both of them and they got the perfect spark gap. <laughs> that would make sense being that uh, if the sun is a, an ultra intelligence, then it, it's emitting all of those fields as yeah. well as other. Exactly, exactly. And you can, measure, you can measure Kundalini in the infrasound, but you can measure it also in the microwave. Uh, Riel. Thank you. Wow, uh, this is amazing. I'm loving it, and such a good turnout for our for our audience as well. Like in our Gen Z community, our 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 group loves these lectures, Dan. So thank you so much for for sharing this with us. Um, at the beginning, you, you well halfway through, you said that you didn't want to get too deep into the esoteric side of things, but really, like uh, we actually have been partnering up with a friend of the show of ours. His name is Ani. And we do deep dives into the esoteric occult side of things. And we're actually incorporating a lot of your work into explaining the occult esoteric stuff that we think is going on behind the scenes. So maybe in a future lecture, don't hold back on, you know, go, going too deep into the esoteric because we're really trying to bridge the, the science that you're presenting with the woo woo stuff that uh, <laughs> is going on behind uh, everything. But uh, Let's see a few questions. Okay, so the hmm, where should I start? So, what do you think of the shape of the Earth? Because in some areas they say it's a sphere, some say it's an egg shaped. Then obviously some people say it's flat. Whatever. Like, do you have any uh, uh, personal views on that cosmology of of our planet? 
Well, first, with regard to your, your first comment, I agree completely. I think that, for example, we need to understand a lot more about where ghosts go. We need to understand a lot more about nature spirits and elementals go and why and what enables uh, ghosts and ancestors to propagate and what it allows elementals to propagate. So the esoteric aspect of plasma, living plasma, is essential to understanding spiritual evolution. Absolutely. I agree with you. Uh, regarding shape of the earth, uh, <laughs> You know, when, when Michael Rice says that something is going wrong, he uses an old Irish expression, which has said, well, everything went pear-shaped, <laughs> which actually, according to geophysics, is the shape of the earth. It's pear-shaped. One end is a little bit bigger than the other. It's, it's pretty unspherical, actually. <laughs> and uh, the Irish name for something that went wrong is pear-shaped. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it, actually, the earth is a bit more harmonic inclusiveness as well. But it's true that you can't make stable gravity without having essentially a spherical state. Interestingly, it is true that any planet that evolved from a, a molten state uh, and cooled like the Earth will be largely hollow. And, and that's, that's actually introduction of membrane theory about the hollow Earth. And that, for example, even the inside of the Earth has a low energy LENR nuclear reaction going on with nickel and copper, which is why it's called the smoky god, because inside there is a glow. There is a sun inside, actually. So there's a lot to the physics of Earth. Thanks for that. Uh, OK, cool. And then another question, uh, my, my final question is, uh, there is something that uh, Dave and I were looking at the other day uh, in relation to uh, X-ray. And it was the inventor of the X-ray actually had something that he called the J phenomenon. And I was wondering if you've heard about this. I, that was my question. Yeah, okay. Well, Dan, I, I, you can, uh, Dave, you can elaborate on that. I'd like to just share my screen very quickly for everybody to see here. C.G. Barkla and the J phenomenon. Um, we see here that this was allegedly suppressed very, very quickly. Um, we'll see here C.G. Barkla and the J phenomenon, a case study in the treatment of deviance in uh, physics. Um, do you happen to know anything about this, sir? Um, would just define the J phenomenon briefly. It's, uh, it, Riel, would you help me explain this just so I don't... Uh, well, on his Wikipedia page, uh, it explains that basically uh, the scientists at the time uh, did not accept his uh, C.J. Bar Barclow's theories because they said it was, it was basically the Compton effect. So the Compton effect, uh, I believe, had something to do with uh, X-ray scattering. And he was trying to account for how uh, there was uh, like energy that wasn't disappearing and yeah. it sounded like his theories were exactly what you're talking about with non-destructive charge collapse but it, but wikipedia if you just go to it he says oh he is also known for a uh, scientific theory he called j phenomena that re scientists refused to accept and sim and said that it's the Compton effect so I, I can't really explain it but it was just an example of something that sounds exactly like what you're trying to talk about um, um, um well the the the, the j phenomena uh, in terms of the, the law in physics that uh, energy and mass cannot be destroyed, um, it, there is an interesting corollary, which would be that phase conjugation may disobey the law. <laughs> because uh, w when the uh, plasma or charge goes through the zero point, which is the conjugate point, and it, it, there is neg entropy, perfected charge collapse can create a distribution which could dis disobey that law. And interestingly, uh, and again, I haven't studied this, so I can't comment very much, but um, depend on the angle of incident radiation, that, that this, this is how the structure of DNA was originally discovered. Uh, X-ray diffraction, X-ray uh, 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 distribution, Compton scattering. So we would not know the geometry of DNA was a double helix, a dodeca ratchet down a helix today if it weren't for X-ray scattering. And interestingly, at the center of imploding DNA, the physics of human bliss, we get the phenomena of people making gravity and people disappearing and people going into stargates. The physics of bliss, because of the perfected phase conjugate charge implosion in DNA, so <laughs> I, think, I think there's lots of room for phenomena like the J phenomena uh, once we understand deeply what phase conjugate neg entropy means. I mean, you ask an expert in phase conjugate optics what's happening in the center of a phase conjugate mirror while the time reversal and neg entropy is being measured and they scratch their heads, man, they don't have a clue. <laughs> But the, the inertia has gone down into the longitudinal array, and that 
is what a stargate is. And that it means matter could be disappearing and reappearing elsewhere. And that's what action at a distance is. So I think there's lots of room for investigating, but I haven't researched the J phenomenon specifically. Uh, Rio? Yeah, thanks. Okay, so I said that that was my last question, but if you've got the time, uh, with uh, our discussion with Ani over the weekend, uh, we looked at the Super Bowl and we looked at the symbolism of the Super Bowl and it seemed like the stadium itself was in the shape of a scarab beetle, which seems like it's in the shape of a sphere. So when you say that the sphere is used in only certain situations, I just wanted to throw that out there that it seemed like this event of kind of like a uh, getting people to focus their attention on a specific thing. I wonder how that could affect things on a, a bigger scale if we're all focusing on something that seems to be causing cancer, which, as you're saying, is the shape of a, like a sphere is related to cancer. Well, maybe you didn't see my Facebook post that went viral, but I put 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 a Facebook post that said the real Super Bowl, and I put the rotating Grail cup within a cup, which is the Super Bowl. And, <laughs> and it's true if if you rotate a golden spiral down a caduceus, you get the perfect Grail cup cup within a side, side cup. That, and and that's I and everybody loves the the, the perfect Super Bowl. Well, uh, actually, when Rolling Thunder learned which beetle's belly to tickle, to make rain, <laughs> uh, it, it was a fractal nervous system. And the, the Egyptians, uh, scarab beetle was sacred for some very good physics. Uh, actually, I think it was Elizabeth Hay's son who was looking, focusing intently upon a scarab beetle. And he looked up and said, mother, I just remembered my past lives. <laughs> But the reason was because it was a perfect black hole. <laughs> so I don't think a scarab beetle is very spherical, actually. Uh, I'm speculating that it has a lot more recursion and charge implosion in its structural stability and morphogenesis. That would be my hypothesis. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. So if the, like, if the stadium theoretically is, is meant to reflect a scarab beetle, then in a way, uh, everybody's energy is directing towards a black hole. Yeah, that's Interesting. right. Interesting. Wow. Uh, okay. The, the Egyptians would hug you if you told them that was a scarab beetle. They'd love you. <laughs> okay. So, Thank that, you so much. That, that was the way through death, man. <laughs> what are uh, if I could ask uh, on this thought, Dan? What are your thoughts of um, the the I guess you could say the quote unquote physical world we currently live in being partially physical and some elements of it being um just extremely astrally dense vibrations that have been many have you know speculated you can put this as part of some type of trap that we're in of sorts so to speak but th does that make any sense by chance well the core of what we're saying all night tonight is that the difference between matter and energy is a threshold of compression which mm. is a very fuzzy line right and and that as charge gets more and more compressed we call we call this part matter and we've called that part energy, but it's all a cloud of plasma. One is just a little bit more compressed than the other. That's the only difference. It's all the same stuff. Mm. And to say that part of that is spiritual and part of that is, is matter is childish. Actually, it's the rotation of the charge from the long wave into the short wave that creates the compression. And it's the relationship. That's why you know, Catholics who say, well, I don't need to take care of my body because my spirit is important. Well, that is schizophrenic because ultimately, if you don't take care of your body, your plasma cloud is going to die. And that is your spirit. So it is the geometry of what's imploding the charge into your body, which is attracting that relationship of the outer cloud to the inner cloud. And that scale of compression is continuous, not discontinuous. Though there is actually no firm line between matter and energy. No, it's all a cloud. Mm, got you. And and one one final question from my end of things. Uh, I may sound to some, um, maybe not so much live right now, but to the audience watching it later, whether on your end or my end. But I, I don't care because I I feel comfortable enough to ask this. But in at any point in your life, have you ever, um, in your own personal opinion or beliefs, come across um, non-human entities of any kind? whether it's phys physical or non? <laughs> yeah, I mean, 
we had Richard Leviton at my farm going out and talking to the Ophanum angels in the backfield. <laughs> and and Marty, Marty Kane, very famous, the labyrinth builder, she was adopting the elementals and taking them back to our art studio in Boston. And they were seeing these critters. And, oh, I mean, I mean, I've been doing that all my life. And we had uh, little UFOs. And then I had some telepathics with the Andromedans. And <laughs> no. And what about, what about um, uh, shape-shifting? reptilian anything like this of any kind well i don't have that much personal experience of course i've studied i think the concept of the fact that the aura is is mutable uh, pleomorphogenesis as it were uh is real and those who have better control of their aura they can shape shift and that doesn't mean you're good or bad it's an right. evolution that's necessary and the ability to see the aura change is is a healthy thing uh and it's true that, see, the reptilian species had more, uh, more focus in the spine and uh, the amygdala. And that right. gave them leverage on a different part of the spectrum. Uh, reptilian brain focus versus bird brain focus. You know, serpent bird man, Quetzalcoatl, the whole thing. And so this ability to shapeshift is not an indication of good or evil. And right. Th there are very evolved reptilian races as well. And, uh, you know, the universe is a very big place. And this idea of simple good and evil is too childish, actually. By chance, uh, before we pass it on to Riel, uh, have you uh, just not a, a this is a good faith question, not out of bad faith. Have you seen at any point in your life any type of biological alterations like shape shifting in, in real time? Have you happened to see a gray or anything like this? Uh, many friends who have, uh, I don't think so. You know, my, the, the Sidhis that developed with my Kundalini uh, were more in the area of clear audience. So I have heard the voices of incredible beings in my life, actually, because I am clairaudient a bit and, uh, and less clairvoyant. Although my mother, a famous artist, ThelmaWinter.com, she was very clairvoyant, actually. And we even had a discussion one time of why I didn't inherit her clairvoyance. <laughs> Wow. Wow. Pretty cool. Um, Rio, please. Thanks. Uh, so uh, a question about the day that you discovered the uh, that your equation fit perfectly into uh, Priori's yeah. uh, work. Uh, do you remember the date that, that you've had this equation and how did you celebrate? <laughs> well, you know, I had evolved that work when I first discovered that hydrogen radii were golden ratio multiples of Planck. And then we extended that and proved the exact two frequencies of photosynthesis were also, and then Schumann harmonics and the whole story uh, as the origin of neg entropy. And that's maybe 10, 12 years ago. Now, something on the order of, I think about seven to eight years ago, uh, you know, we had been studying Priory in, uh, in, on and off for 20 years, however, some of our partners uh, began looking up the tables of the frequencies in more detail after I published my equation, Golden Ratio Multiple Planck. And then we discovered, you know, there's only a certain bandwidth in which you can modulate the infrasound into plasma, you know, roughly, I don't know, 20 up to a few thousand hertz. That's, that's, that's pretty narrow. And the frequency in which you get anything interesting in brain waves and heart waves is the same bandwidth. So if you look in that bandwidth of frequencies and which numbers Priori was using, and there's four or five of them that are bang on my equation, that was like the day we realized what was behind. And I had spent 20 years yearning to replicate Priori and never was brave enough until that day when we realized the principle behind what he, he was spending millions of dollars on every gadget he built, but didn't understand the principle. And when biophysics doesn't understand the principle, eventually you get tortured. So once you understand the principle, phase conjugate neg entropy is behind the charge collapse that causes the self-organization. Then we could build it because we knew how to make two opposing plasma tubes. You know, all those pictures of Rife and, Lako and Lakovsky uh, with plasma tubes, they were using plasma, but they didn't know how to make opposing pairs 180 degrees out of phase with the broad spectral pine cones kissing noses. So all that came like a rush into my awareness the minute we saw Priori's frequencies fit the equation. Then we knew exactly what to do. Therify.net. Anybody else? Uh... I'll ask one time around if anyone's got any more questions and then we'll, um, we'll call it. And again, sir, thank you so very much for your time.
Uh, anybody well, here? And Dan, how did you uh, celebrate? Like when you <laughs> had that when you had that rush of like realization of this breakthrough. Actually, <laughs> no, no. We then we scratched around to save up the money to build a prototype. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was with great enthusiasm. And I do have to credit my partner, Paul Harris. You know, that idea was mine. However, Paul Harris had the great lifetime of background with uh, uh, Brown's gas and how to trigger noble gases for healing. And so he had the electrical skills at that point to build the prototype after I had the idea on what the core principle was. And so Paul Harris and I were ideal partners at therify.net. So I need to credit my partners as well and thank them. So we, wow, we, well, we celebrated by trying to build it. And the good thing is we found people immediately that wanted to try it. And so it took off fast. We had fun. And it works. Well, wow. Well, sir, I, I'd like to thank you so very much for, for coming on. It's been a, a pleasure and an honor. And um, yes, is there anything you'd like to say to the audience of where they can find you, how they can find your work and all of that? Well, most people know fractalfield.com and uh, youtube.com slash Dan Winter Fractal Field. We're near a million views. That's where this, and then the, this film series particularly will be at goldenmean.info slash measuring life force. And the next interview with Elena Danan is just a couple of days, which we talk about the ET part of this story. And uh, we just want to thank you for your interest. The key point here is that Measuring life force reveals the beauty of what life force and consciousness is, and studying the physics of the history of microscopy can lead us to the next step in creating real blissful evolution. So thank you for caring. And thank well, you, Dave and Real, for having such a great group here. We had fun. Thank you. Uh, this, well, thank you, sir. For, if you hadn't uh, you know, responded to our uh, email a handful of months ago, this would not have been possible. So uh, thank you so very much once again, and we'll catch you all next time, everybody. Blessings. Blessings. Thank you, Irena, too. Thank you, Real. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. All right. Take care. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you Irena. Goodbye. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.